How's everybody doing? How many of you brought a friend that you invited? That, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> if you guys were here last week, then uh, maybe you've already felt a little pressure. And I've been praying for you that you would feel just the conviction of the Holy... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'll stop. I'm going to keep on going. Uh, Jason was out tonight. He gets to have the opportunity to, to be at a, um, at a track meet with his son, Ian. And uh, so... Uh, it's so exciting for me to get to be here with you again tonight. Uh, we're going to do just a, a quick devotional. We're going to look at John chapter 19. And um, we're getting ready for Holy Week. And there's three chapters in a row. Um, John 17, 18, and 19, where Jesus is, is really, sorry, 15, 16, and 17, that really lead up to Jesus' arrest. And he spends this time with his disciples, and he gives them just a lot of different instruction. He talks about how he's praying for them, how he's encouraging them. He talks about uh, the ways that, that he is the vine and they are the branches. And if they remain in him and, and uh, that they will bear fruit and apart from him, they can do nothing. There's, there's all kinds of, of interesting. It's one of the longest passages of almost straight red letters, you know. You get that in Matthew and the Beatitudes, but here in John you get the, a very similar thing where you have three chapters of really unbroken Jesus speaking. And I want to go towards the end because he says some just really special things. They're, they're very unique things. This is the only place you find these verses. Uh, you might remember that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because they, have, they share about 70% of their content. They tell similar stories or same stories. But John only includes a few stories from those synoptic gospels. So John kind of stands alone. And it was also written quite late. It was written a lot later than the rest of them. There's arguments about how late, but probably anywhere from A.D. 60 until A.D. 90, somewhere around, somewhere in that space. So John is writing after most of the other disciples have probably been martyred, and he's writing this to try to fill in some gaps in some ways and, uh, and trying to solve some of the crises that are happening in that 30-year-old church and trying to help him understand more about what Jesus taught. John is really fun, too, to listen to. You know, he, he talks about himself in a kind of a unique way. He says that he is Jesus' beloved. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm writing a gospel that is my particular uh, experience, and if I call myself the beloved, it just seems a little bit strange, don't you think? John really cares about the unity of the church. He speaks over and over again, both in his gospel and in the three books of John later, about the unity of the church. He talks about how we need to be together in brotherly love. He focuses on this a lot. And so one of the key passages as you read through these different chapters of 15, 16, and 17, you find right at the end of 17, and we're just going to read this together and then I'll comment on a few things. So we'll start in verse 6. So John chapter 17, verse 6. It says, Jesus says, I have revealed to you, I'm sorry, I have revealed you to those who, who you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. It's a good, a good verse. Now they know everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I mean, I don't know about you, but the Great Commission is in my mind, right? I think about all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples, right? Then he says at the end, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He says in there, to obey all that I've commanded you. And this, this is just kind of re-saying re that everything that I've told them, they've accepted. They recognize that I came from you and now you are in them. Verse 9, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. Think about that. The glory that Jesus receives is coming through his followers. Why is that? How does God, Jesus, get glorified through his own people? We should have another Thursday night or Wednesday night on that, okay? I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. 
While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. That was Judas, by the way. Verse 13 says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. You think about Jesus' heart for his disciples. He, know that he knows his time with them is coming to a close rapidly. In fact, just a few verses from now, verse, the beginning of chapter 18, he gets arrested. And so this is really part, some people think this is part of his dialogue at the Last Supper with, with, with his disciples. And, and you're thinking about his, his passion for them, the way that he's speaking about how he loves them, and how he expects that God will protect them from the evil one. He knows that times are going to be tough, doesn't he? But I want you to listen to this next verse. My prayer is not for them alone. This is verse 20. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Who is that? Who is he talking about? Listen, Jesus is looking into his disciples' eyes and he's looking past them to the thousands of generations of faith that will come next. And yes, we're an extension of that. We're here because of the disciples' testimony and their witness of what they saw. In fact, even reading this book and, and seeing what it means to us today is just an overflow of God's work in Jesus' life and into the disciples that he made. And we are those links in the chain. We're, we're, we're far down in the generations, 2,000 years past. Listen, here's a really cool thing. You know, in 2033, it's like 10 years from now, Easter of 2033 will be the 2,000 year anniversary of the first Easter. You thought about that yet? There's a whole move within the missions world saying, can we complete the Great Commission? Can we get a church established in every unreached people group on the planet before Easter of 2033? Is 2,000 years enough time for us to make sure that every family of the earth from Genesis 12, every family has a witness of the gospel in their own tribe, tongue, and language? Guys, I'm excited. I'm excited because we're within striking distance. There are some mission, missiologists today that think we are within the scope and space of that happening, that the one-third of the planet that has never heard the gospel, that there's movements within them that are growing so fast that if we project it forward, we could see the accomplishment of the Great Commission by the year 2033. Somebody should say amen for that one. The movement that Jesus started, the prayer that he prays right here continues in us and through us. And if you keep going with me here, it says that all of them, this is verse 21, all of them may be one, Father, just as you and me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The way that we love Jesus and the way that we love each other is the testimony to a dying world that what we say is true. And so tonight, as we think about Palm Sunday coming, Easter Sunday about 10 days away, think about the dying world that God has chosen us to reach out to. How many of them today are lost, but Jesus' prayer applied to them as well? Because he's going to call out to them and they're going to respond. And Jesus says, even those who hear your message, I'm praying for them. So let's pray that God would open the hearts of the lost and open our mouths as we have opportunities to love and care and share and pray and give and spend ourselves on behalf of the needy, the hurting, the broken. That is nothing less than what this entire Passion Week is about. The Jesus who gave up everything he had to join us in this place 
to walk a human life without sin and die a gruesome death on our behalf. And by the grace of God was raised to new life, just like he promises each of us will be. What an incredible gospel we have. I've been pushing you guys pretty hard the last 10 days. But it's not because I'm mad at you. It's because I think there's an urgency to the work that we're supposed to be about. And God has called us to be his people. And he's called us to represent himself to the lost. Uh, At the end of next month, we're going to have a Mission Sunday. Uh, April the 29th will be the Mission Sunday. And uh, I get to preach that day. And one of the things we're going to do that is we're going to release a podcast that we've been working on. And uh, the podcast will be a missions podcast. And we're going to use it to tell stories from in the church. Uh, One of the big problems if you're a missions pastor is trying to find ways to get good information in front of everybody. You know, I can give you a pamphlet every year. I can give you a magazine once a year. And I can have mission team members do two or three minute videos. But I can't take a space where they can have 30 minutes or 40 minutes to talk about their experiences. So this podcast kind of opens the door for us to say, hey, here's some important things. We called the, the podcast So That. If you remember last week, we were talking about Psalm 67. And it says... Uh, Psalm 67 1 says, May the Lord be gracious to us and bless us. Remember this? May his face shine upon us. And the first two words of verse 2 are so that he may be, he may be, he may be known in all the earth and his salvation among all the nations. So the podcast is called So That. And so what I want to leave you with tonight is just this comment. With all that God has done for you, so that... He can reach the people through you. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you willing? And will you obey what God has called us to do? I hope that you enjoy the rest of this chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. And seeing how Jesus prayed for his disciples and that they would be one, I can tell you that we need every one of you. We need the whole church to reach the whole world. We can't do it without you. So join us, pray for the lost, and be faithful followers of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for all that you're doing around us. We thank you for your prayer, Lord, that so many years ago was not just thinking of the people surrounding you, but the people that many would come through them, Father. We thank you for your heart. We pray, God, that you would give us your courage and passion. Use us for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just uh, one announcement before we finish is